that Daniel Boone was involved in the jousting. When Daniel Boone was here and he walked the ground right above our house, the roads when Daniel Boone was here were really up on top of the mountains, which are relatively flat. If you look at the Appalachians, they don't have the peaks because they've been worn down. I mean, these are the oldest mountains on earth. My name is H. William Smith. I go by Bill. And H is my entire first name. It doesn't even get a period. My dad wanted to give me something I could spell. I came out here 30 years ago chasing a woman who had been on tour with Roadside Theater. Her name was Nancy Countess. Her family has been in this region for about 300 years. They're one of the original families. And she played my hall at the University of Montana, and the next thing I knew, I lived here. And that was in 1994. Here is Big Stone Gap, Virginia. And it's interesting because Big Stone and I had a strange relationship for a long time. This used to be the newspaper, the Post. My office was right over there when I worked for them in 1996. And we experienced the wind down of the coal industry and Westmoreland Coal, which was the controlling coal interest in this area, headed west at that time. This area didn't know what to do with itself. It had been coal oriented for a hundred years and it had had its ups. Uh, we were talking a little earlier about the fact that there was jousting out on Main Street. I mean, this was kind of a, it was an atmosphere in, especially right around 1900, where it was part of the golden age. And people were coming from New York. Fritzy's, Fritzy's chef, say that fast 10 times, um, was married to John Fox Jr. His house, is almost diagonally over my right shoulder, which is st still exists in the shape that he left it. And they were the stars of the community. That was the environment that was here. And then it started to falter. Much later, after World War II, really, because both World War I and World War II fueled this economy. But afterwards, the combined less smaller need for coal and also mechanization changed the economy here forevermore. And the truth of the matter is people really didn't know what to do with themselves. In one sense, they were afraid. Well, that was the atmosphere I moved here in. And there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of confusion as to how do you rebuild an economy that's been single source. Over the years, I became involved, because that's my tendency, and I got involved first with the newspaper, then the Trail of the Lonesome Pine, uh, which was an outdoor drama, started, I think we're going on our 60th year. I did 35 and 37. And it was started as a tourism idea to bring people to town. Because there were folks here who understood that they were gonna to have to change what this place was about. Well, there were a bunch of abortive attempts, one thing. The Crooked Road actually was enabled right here in Big Stone Gap. And I can tell you that its first office was here in Big Stone Gap because it was in my house on a laptop computer. When we looked at the job, my wife, who had toured for 23 years, and then she and I had toured together, we looked at the job and we said, this is nuts. You know, it was a one-man operation. But the seeds of that, evidently that and Round the Mountain, which was its companion craft-oriented organization, the seeds took hold. We gave it five years, and it's now coming up on 20. 
what's happened recently, and this is really kind of interesting in a way, COVID really helped this place. This, where we are right now, Good Times, started out as the Big Stone Gap General Store. The building had laid vacant. And frankly, members of our family started that part of the business and then sold it to the folks who came here from California. We never had anybody come here from California. I was the stranger that came from Montana. And by that time, people were really starting to wake up to the fact that our product really is our own culture. And I say our because I've been here 30 years. And it's funny, when I go back to Montana now, it's like it takes me two or three weeks to relax into that lifestyle because I'm still here. It is getting to be so much fun around here that at times I really wonder if I want to go back other than the fact I have three grandkids up the road. And I have a beautiful place out there that I built. Now, this place is exciting. And there's a lot of people deserve the credit. I am not one of them. We basically laid the groundwork. But what actually happened was a change in leadership in the community. And a guy like, named Steve Lawson came to town as town manager. He had a different vision. There's a, there's a thing in Appalachia of not wanting to allow outsiders in. And it goes all the way back to when the roads were almost non-existent. And these societies were enclaves. Steve's idea was to open it up and to treat it like what we all felt it was, which was a beautiful place. Springtime, I mean, Aaron Copeland was right. Appalachian Spring. Right now we're kind of verging on dog. We're waiting for Redbud winter to come. And I saw a couple of dogwoods on the way into town. I live out in Powell Valley out at a place called Buffalo Gap which was one of the old original settlements. Our house is on the site of the old Buffalo Gap School. It's right across from uh, Lonesome Pine Country Club, which is coming up on 100 years old. Again, going back to that era of plenty and that era when all of the things we're trying to create now were actually happening full bore because there was money everywhere in the coal industry. Now, not a lot of that money stayed here a lot of that money went to Pittsburgh. But the elements were here. Now, we're sitting in a place where there are four venues having music within a quarter mile of where we're sitting. And this was the Vanguard. Here at Good Times was the Vanguard. We all had to play, I'm a musician, and we all had to play out of town because there was no place to play here other than summers with the trail or the occasional thing that went on that we would you know get hired for now <laughs> there's there's musicians coming from all over the country to this region and this isn't just big stone gap this whole region has become this exciting mix of culture and finally youth we've got young people staying or coming Economically, because it was depressed, housing costs are still less here than most of the rest of the country. So people can come here and get a start. Artists can come here and get a start. Just folks who want to live a lifestyle that is admittedly a lot slower than, you know, maybe New York or Atlanta or Cincinnati, which is where everybody went to get work. Detroit, places where folks had to go, especially during World War II, to find work and were imported basically for their labor. Now, the prayer is by allowing a little bit more entrepreneurship, which was suppressed. Folks are starting businesses that aren't coal related. Musicians are starting to base out of here and start to play, starting to play over in Bristol. Why do you think it was suppressed, going back to what you just said? Labor. They wanted everyone to work. 
There were 50,000 people in the coal mines that surround this area. It's an interesting area geologically because to the west is sandstone and that's where the coal is. I look across at limestone cliffs in Powell Valley. There's no coal over there. Limestone, does, it, coal doesn't form in limestone. So they wanted the labor. They were importing labor from overseas, blacks from the south. Folks came to this area for one thing, and that was to work in the mines. It was all hand loading. There was very little mechanization. With mechanization, these mountains can only hold so many people in their natural state. With the coal industry, it provided coal camps where hundreds of people would live. Now, the fact of the matter was, if you lost your job, they would put your stuff out on the street. They would pay you in scrip, which was not real money. You can see examples of scrip over at the Harry Metter Coal Museum and up at the Southwest Virginia Museum. So they effectively controlled where you lived, how you got paid, and this went on for years. And that really was the determinant. Entrepreneurship was suppressed. They held the newspaper, basically, you know. You know, people go where the money is. They held the government. Their people got elected. And it was that environment, really, that I moved into the last vestiges of. And my wife had grown up in all the way, way before coal, going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. And her people were centered around Galax, which is another musical center of this region. And some of them came over. When the Bristol Sessions happened in 1927, my father-in-law was playing in these mountains with his brothers as the Countess Brothers Band. I now play his fiddle. And that is, my mother-in-law literally put it in my hands, said, this is Tom's fiddle, learn it. Now you'd have to have known my mother-in-law. She was about five foot two inches tall and a woman of the mountains. I mean, she was raised out along the Kentucky-Virginia border um, in Dickinson County. And her people came to this area Austinville, which is just north of uh, Galax, was her family. Stephen F. Austin came out of that group of folks as people moved to Texas. That was back in the 1820s. So there's all of this stuff tied up in this area. There's all of these stories. Now, what's really cool is there are people, there are people in this room right now who came here from California and fell in love with it. We could never get them to do that, you know? It was, it was hard, they weren't, they weren't coming here, but COVID changed a lot of societies in the country. And there are people now who wanna be out of the cities. They wanna be out in smaller areas. This place, although to be honest, it has been damaged by coal mining, this area, I, I call it, it hairs over pretty quick. It grows things fast. And a lot of that damage is contained actually out to the west of us. But what it also does is it makes great places for people to recreate on four wheel, going four wheeling. Now, there's a problem with that in that it has a tendency to kind of tear up the mountains. So the controls we're still learning how to adequately control that. But the facility exists. To our, and I'd say to, to my left, is the whole massive of high knob that really runs all the way down to Tennessee. The rivers, the Powell River comes through town. The clinch to our uh, east and the Holston. Those were the big transit, those were the highways into this area. Now, we have highways, which was a real issue. When I came here, 23 was not completed in the way it is. And now you can come from anywhere in the country and basically drive four lane road to get here, which then allows us 
to bring people here so that they're, they're not stressed out from driving the road in front of my house, which is two lane and curvy as all heck. Reading, writing, and Route 20, 23. Well, they brought, them, they brought them up to Detroit during the war and literally had, they were, folks were great workers. There's always been a great work ethic here, which is really handy when you're trying to change a society. People are willing to try. Now they see results. And that has changed everything. But then, yeah, people wanted out of here. And they went to Detroit. They had schools set up um, at the factory there at Willow Run, building B-24s, one of which may have been the one my dad flew in in World War II. And there were thousands of them. Now, when we see a Michigan plate coming in, a lot of times it's family coming back. And they may not move back here, some do. But they come back to where their family came from. Appalachians, and I know this because I wasn't able to pry my wife out of here to go to Montana. And after a while I quit trying and I just figured I'd just stay here. People here are attached to this place, which makes the richness even greater. The stories are just, this is a storytelling place. Both my wife and I are st storytellers. That's how we met. Um, she was doing Appalachian-based storytelling and music with Ron Short, Tommy Bledsoe, Ben Mays, Kim Mays on a national tour. They just happened to play my hall one day and I took them dancing after the show. Next thing I knew I was here and we've been dancing ever since. The Daniel Boone was involved in the jousting. When Daniel Boone was here and he walked the ground right above our house, the roads, when Daniel Boone was here, were really up on top of the mountains, which are relatively flat. If you look at the Appalachians, they don't have the peaks because they've been worn down. I mean, these are the oldest mountains on earth. We have a chair that my father, actually it's, it was my father's family, that they walked here from the Galax area with a horse, of course, but there were no, um, there were no roads for wagons. The jousting came later, and the jousting came right around, I think, the turn of the century, between, you know, the 19th century and the 20th. Then there were roads, and there were places where you could joust. You ain't gonna be able to joust on, on uh, a deer trail, and that's an Indian trails, because we also forget that this place was first inhabited by Native Americans. And that conflict, there are stories in every family that's been around here um, of the battle. It was interesting, early on in the 1790s, all of the, actually before 1790, the forts all faced north because the fear was of the Shawnee and the Iroquois Confederacy. When the Shawnee finally said, there's uh, no point in us fighting you the way we have, you're going to win. Technology won over knowledge of the place. The forts then all of a sudden shifted down into this part of Southwest Virginia, looking at the Cherokee. And 1794, when um, Chief Benj um, actually was up in the valley not far from my house and kill, killed a family and was hunted down essentially right above where we live. That was the last Cherokee incursion in the area. After that, this area for about a hundred years started to transition from lumber, early industries that basically served the area to when coal after the Civil War really started to take hold. That's when the jousting um, started to be, because there was money. First of all, jousting is not a cheap hobby. You have to have a, you know, a horse that, you know, in your mind is a war horse, and you have to have armor, especially since the other guy is carrying this great big long stick, and he wants to stick it in you and knock you off your horse. They weren't trying to kill each other. They are just trying to knock each other off their horses. But it was really in that period of time, and that's when John Fox Jr., came to this area with his wife, Fritzi Sheff, who was an opera singer. 
So there was, there was this whole thing that was going on in that gold, kind of the golden age um, that was taking place all over the country. And it was that kind of celebration of life that would take place again in the 20s after. Remember that the 20s hit this area in a different way because it was so small. The 1918 flu epidemic, my wife lost her uncle. Actually, excuse me, my wife lost her aunt. Her uncle was shot to death by revenuers in 1921. This was not an area that you wanted, you know, the first police force in the area was started at that, th that time, and that is the story of the Trail of the Lonesome Pine. It was the police guard, because Richmond, and before that, uh, Williamsburg, were days rides away. They didn't do a lot of controlling of things out here, other than to supply lead and, and gunpowder to the militiamen who were there holding off the Indians. Donaldson's Indian line, which was surveyed in 1760, 1769, divided. This part where we're sitting right now was Indian land. To the east, or the, it was white folks could settle there. Well, the guy who negotiated the treaty already had surveyors over on this side laying out plots of land to sell, which is the story of the rest of the country as far as Native Americans and the European incursion that went all the way out to Montana and beyond. All these things created a stew, and that stew was the Appalachian culture. It was one of those things that, yeah, people wanted to have fun. As my mother-in-law used to say, in fact, she asked me one time, and she was an old regular Baptist. She didn't drink. But she asked me one day, Billy, can you get me any of that white liquor? She made cough syrup, rock candy, and moonshine, which it wasn't really called. And it was the old Scots-Irish tradition of making liquor that was true of the Whiskey Rebellion and the Scots-Irish of this area, because most of the settlers in this area were Scots-Irish, and they came after being forced again out of Scotland and Ireland to this country by the British. Many were indentured slaves. Indentured slaves who escaped came to these mountains. Turkish sailors that had been marooned on the islands off of the coast came west and the Melungeon mixture of folks became very prevalent in this area. My wife is both part Cherokee and part Melungeon. This was an area, this was the Old West. This was the true first Old West. This barrier of Pine Mountain, Stone Mountain that is to our west, we're really based almost right out our back door. Again, if you're riding a horse or you're, you know, you're trying to pull a wagon, there's very little that you can do over the tops of them. But the gaps, Pound Gap was here in Wise County, and that's where, going back to Daniel Boone, that's where he went north to fight the Shawnee down to the south of us was Cumberland Gap. 300,000 people came through here on their way west, out Cumberland Gap. It was an area that people came to, some stayed. Some only got this far. Some never made it a step further. And really, these hills are a graveyard of the pioneers of America. Boone had his own troubles in this country. But he lived, his son was killed down south of us in Lee County. So there's all this stuff, which getting back to the jousting, by that time, there was some, some stability in the area because industry and the Industrial Revolution 
was taking hold. And the railroad opened this area. It wasn't the roads that opened this area, it was the railroad. And the railroad, you, could, you, you used to be able to take a train from here in Big Stone Gap or Appalachia, three miles to the west of us, all the way into Bristol. And you could go in there and shop for the day and literally take the train home. You could also drink on the train. And by that time, it was getting, it was getting a little restrictive. And some of, the, some of the guys used to ride the interstate railroad between here and Appalachia and just ride back and forth so they, so they could drink. And most of what they were drinking was coming out of these hills. Moonshining was not something that you, could, you did just to make liquor. Corn is bulky and heavy. Liquor is transportable for more money. And it was an economy. It wasn't just, you know, that they wanted to get drunk and lay in the street, although that did happen. It was an economic boon to the area. It was how people could get hard, what they called hard money. And that, because most of, of what went on here was trade. And like I, I said earlier, the coal companies, they paid in scrip which was, and there's examples of tokens that look like coins, but the only place you could spend the coin was at the company store. Well, if you could trade a little white liquor for some American cash, then you could go to a store in Bristol and trade. And that was an awful lot of what was going on in that period of time when probably right out here on Wood Avenue, Guys would be trying to stick each other with sticks on, on horses. But it didn't last that long because again, you had the next downturn. And then you had World War I. And then you had the flu epidemic. And then you had the Roaring Twenties where things went up again. But then you had the Depression and World War II. This area, the way I've kind of characterized it, was a national sacrifice zone for the war efforts and for the steel that was made out of Pittsburgh in Chicago. My grandfather hauled coke into the steel mills of the South Works in Chicago between about 1910 and 1945 after the war when he finally walked in one day and said, I'm done. And he was a character in his own right, but that's another story other than one thing, and that is he was a great shotgun shot, and he took Ernest Hemingway hunting. So maybe the storytelling thing, maybe it, it rubbed off on him, and he, was, he would make me dance a, a jig. He'd sing to me over the phone Irish jigs, and make me dance. He died in 1954, so I only knew him for three years, and I was just a little teeny kid. But I still remember that. But all of these people were these characters who'd fought hard. He was thrown out on the streets of Chicago at 12 years old, an orphan. That happened here. Families didn't survive. The most dangerous thing a woman could do in the early pioneer days was have a child. Because if you go to cemeteries, especially in colonial America, you'll see two or three wives and five or six children. And if you look at the dates, many of them didn't live to be a year old. There was no medical care. There was no law. That's how the police guard formed here. When they realized, because there were folks, and this had gone back to before the Civil War, there were bushwhackers. And basically they were vestiges of the old highwaymen in Scotland and Ireland. And they would literally rob you if you were trying to go over Pound Pass, Pound Gap is what it was called. So it was a wild area. And gradually, some of that wildness is still here. But culturally, it now has, has been muted and it's really just part of the fabric of the story. What also was true of this area, because this was really that first barrier to settlement. 
all the traditions and the different things that many Scots and Irish people used in their daily life, both implements, and then how they recreated in small areas where there was, first of all, there wasn't electricity in this area until deep into the 20th century. They entertained at home, and one of the primary ways they did it was their music. And it really has been, when we were talking about forming the Crooked Road and Round the Mountain, the culture and frankly, the physical culture of old Appalachia was dying. And there was a fear that it would go away. The physical culture of the music was also dying. This was in 2002 was when I actually started to get involved only peripherally. I was working next door at the Office on Youth and I was sent to a conference in Asheville where building a creative economy, that idea was really brought to the fore for the first time by the Appalachian Regional Commission and organizations on all the different state lines came to Asheville and it was one of those things where we knew we had to come up with another idea to redevelop the economy here. Well, the Crooked Road, actually, I was, I was having a beer at the bar. And I was going to go out and play with some people I'd met at the conference up on Black Mountain outside of Asheville. And I had a beer with a guy named Todd Christensen. And Todd was with the Department of Housing and Community Development in Virginia and a guy named Joe Wilson, who was the executive director of the National Council for the Traditional Arts. I had my beer and went up and played fiddle. They did a what if. And it was what if we build an economy based on what we already have here, the culture, the physical culture of the antiques and how people lived here, but also the music. When music came to these hills, it had to, just by the nature of, they weren't carrying many pianos up and down these mountains. It was fiddles. And then as the banjo developed, which was later, it's actually an African instrument, basically a stick and a gourd, it developed into what we now know as the banjo. And it went through a lot of different iterations until it got here. And really, what we now call old time music became the music of the mountains. I call it Appalachian mountain music because it has, when you get to its root, it has a very distinctive tenor. It, it, it has a sound. It then spread west. I played it in Montana, but it was different. But I played with a guy from Appalachia who had come out working for the Forest Service, which is where I was working at that time. Don't try and keep up with my employment. It has been a journey from day one, but I've met a lot of people. And he was a fiddler from Appalachia, and he'd come out to Montana. in part of that youth movement out there, which I was a part of. and. We had a great time, and he taught me a lot about it. Well, when I came here, I guess that's one reason why I was so interested in doing the Roadside Theater show, because I was curious. You can't throw a dead cat in Southwest Virginia without hitting a musician. And that, that's, I mean, it's just that way. I mean, but we had no place to play. Well, part of what came out of the Crooked Road was creating places to play. Well, it was hard. Over to the east of us in the Blue Ridge, that culture had taken much more hold because frankly, it was a bit older. This culture here was some of the last, if you look at the dates of when these communities were formed, it's a progression west later and later into the 19th century. Were there people here, Europeans, during the revolution? Yes. They were the long hunters and the pioneers, true pioneers, who
who were kind of up against these mountains and also up against the Shawnee and the Cherokee. That slowed things down. But after the 18th century, things began to expand. The music did too. And where the music first expanded was in church. And a lot of it was line singing. They didn't have a piano. They had a book with shape notes in it. And that's where a lot of the music started to coalesce. Well, you know, that was on Sunday, but on Saturday night, they would take the furniture out of their houses. And my wife tell, tells stories, members of her family, they would, and the furniture would all go out on the land, out on the, the lawn, if there was a lawn, and they would dance. And that music still is played in these mountains. Its origins mostly are Scottish and Irish, but also Palatine Germans, another group of refugees. This is an area of refugees. This is an area of people who were disposable, who were forced west to really, you know, stand here and get killed by the Indians to keep those rich folks over in Eastern Virginia from having to deal with it. And that's really what happened. And a lot of them never lived to 50 years old. Families were wiped out. This is true all the way up and down the Western Appalachian, the Allegheny Mountains all the way up into Pennsylvania. What also was going on though, was the Great Road coming south from Philadelphia, which my wife's father's people came, my wife's mother's people, they came the other great traditional route, which was in through Wilmington, Charleston, and up, and they coalesced right at the Galax area. And then, because poor people will always go towards free land, they came here, ran into another barrier, and many settled in this area. By that time, you're having the issues that are basically the division in the country with the Civil War. And the music reflects all of this because the music is how they told their stories. And it was portable. A fiddle player usually could sing, or if it was a preacher, one of the ways preachers were hired is if they could sing. So you had this thing growing out. Now, it's an endemic part of not only this culture, but the American culture, because Bristol, you know, was where, again, in 1927, the first electric recordings using a microphone instead of an acoustic horn were made um, in Bristol with musicians from out here and the Blue Ridge and as far away as Kentucky and West Virginia. That was truly the big band, and it's our big band, the big the big bang of country music. And it really brought the music to the public because RCA Victor, which was just then the Victor Talking Machine Company, distributed the records. People heard this music and it was new to them. They were used to horn-based music, not acoustic, guitar, fiddle, banjo, and auto harp type music, harmonica. That music then actually had its divisions with Jimmy Rogers coming from Mississippi and Pop Stoneman coming from the Blue Ridge and the Carter family coming from this region to the south of us in what's now Scott County and, and Helton's and Macy's Spring and coming to Bristol to record. Well, the vestiges of those recordings find their way into the music we play today. And you can hear it. This is the beautiful thing. The dream we had is now taking place right where we're sitting. These folks have this music two, three nights a week. And now artists are coming from Kentucky, from Tennessee, from Virginia to play here or up the road at Kirkland's or up the road at the Big Cherry Brewery or up the road at Moondog or over in Appalachia at the Black Bear Barbecue. And we're all playing these places. Now, Appalachia and Big Stone are different. 
This was the company town. This was my, when my wife's first husband was the internal auditor, a real popular position at Westmoreland Coal. He lived out in the new subdivision of that era, and that's where the supervisors, the foreman, the desire was in Appalachia to become someone of a little bit more substance and move to Big Stone Gap because this is where the society was taken place. No, I'm talking, it is the only town in the Appalachian region named Appalachia. And it's just? Three miles away along the Powell River. And it was, it was no easy trip to get between them. There were people when I first came here who rarely ever came even to Big Stone Gap because Appalachia was the commercial center for the coal camps. And, you know, we, we could get in a car and drive 100 miles in an hour and 45 minutes. It could take days to go 100 miles in the 19th century and the early 20th century. So these places were, just by that construct, very hard to get in between. So their cultures grew up within their communities. And the fact of the matter is, so did their music. We did an album years ago called The Music of Coal. And there was a distinctive music of coal right in this region. And then people took it up because coal ran the society. When I was a kid growing up, we shoveled coal into the furnace because that's how we still heat it. It would then get replaced by gas or wood, wood fired. You know, because there's plenty of wood in this country and it's all good hardwood and it's easy, it dried out, it's really good burning wood. This was the beginning of what changed the culture. Well, the music changed with it. I opened my father-in-law's um, fiddle case when my mother-in-law gave it to me. My father-in-law had already passed on. And in there was a card with the lyrics for Little Brown Jug which was actually a very popular big band tune. Radio, which happened at about the same time in these hills as the Bristol Sessions in the 20s. Radio started to become popular as well as the development of portable record players, the Victrola, which were hand cranked, because again, there wasn't a ton of electricity in the area. And the fact is, he was playing what would become a big band tune on fiddle. And, you know, that, that's what they would be singing. So the music starts in Scotland and Ireland, comes to these mountains, starts to change and become uniquely American in its culture, and then spreads west. And not only did the music spread west, but the musicians. The Carters went west. They went to Texas. Actually, they went to Mexico because there, were, there was not a lot of regulation of the, of the radio um, power, and they were playing at a 100,000-watt station on the Mexican-Texas uh, te border that basically could be heard almost to Canada. And... This all happens in the 20s and 30s, and then regulation starts to limit that so that each community could start to have, and there were radio stations here in Big Stone Gap, a lot of them playing gospel music. Stanley's were right up, up the road in, and we always argue with, with Dickinson County, if the Stanley's are in, in Dickinson County or Wise County, because they were kind of right on the border. And the border, you got to realize these mountains don't form real good borders. But yeah, the Stanleys, um, Jim and Jesse McReynolds came out of Coburn right here in Wise County. Doc Boggs, who Mike Seeger would rediscover in the 60s in the folk revival, came from Wise. My wife knew him late in his life. Then you have kids like my wife and her brother who start to play, Thomas played country music in a really popular band in this region called the Fallen Stars. 
Thomas is gone, but some of the vestiges of that band remain. I've played with them. It's a progression. Where's it gonna go? We don't know. I, one thing we do know is it's not the music that is being produced by Nashville. It is still a very organic singer-songwriter oriented music that is now telling the stories of Appalachia today. Now, that story is still different. Big Stone Gap still is the more urban of these two communities. Wise County is interesting because it's, there are communities in pairs, Big Stone Gap and Appalachia, Wise and Pound, which was known as The Pound, and Apple, or Big Wise was known as Gladeville, and then Coburn and St. Paul to the east, which is basically the route in from Abingdon came through St. Paul and into this country. Some of the first settlers in the area were there at St. Paul, and they were basically escapees from the French Revolution on Sugar Hill. And there's a wonderful play about that occurrence because they ended up getting killed by Indians. And the chimney of that original settlement is still there. So there's all these vestiges of both culture and the music talks about it. It also is starting, which was not normal, to talk about the future. Because the future was not an Appalachian mode of thought. People look back, their family histories, because you didn't know what the future might hold. The desire now is to build again. That's why there's entrepreneurship, there's little businesses. Stephen Murray has a pottery shop 200 y 100 yards from here. Well, he's a veteran of a fairly popular band who came to town and now lives here and sings in this bar. And he's sung all over this country and several others. This is what's happening. Dave Egger now lives, and we brought Dave to this region for a festival called Gathering in the Gap, which a number of us started with the park, uh, the Southwest Virginia Museum. This year we're having Rhonda Vincent. We're having the greats of bluegrass at old time, last summer, or last spring, it was Crystal Gale, who's really from right over the mountain, because that's where Loretta Lynn is from. You can take through Appalachia, drive up over the mountain, and go to the Loretta Lynn Museum in, I think it's in Lynch, and it's the old company store. So there's all these things. It's like the ruins are now being repurposed, this place is well over 100 years old, where we're sitting right now, and it was the newspaper office. It's now repurposed as a bar. It's really not a bar, it's a, it's a pizza joint. It's good times. And these things are happening all over. The uh, Big Cherry was, um, it was a lot of different things. But it was all, it was a furniture and actually flooring place, I think, when I came. Um, Kirkland's was the mutual, which is seen in the movie Big Stone Gap. So there's all this stuff happening right now. And because of COVID, we had to stay home. Well, we snuck out, like everybody else in the country. Where do we sneak out? Right here. Because this was the only place at that time that was having music and pizza. There's pizza joints, but they're your typical commercial pizza joints. This wasn't commercial. And that, I think, was its appeal. Now, its appeal has grown to where people start to know that Big Stone Gap is a place where you can have a lot of fun on a Saturday night. And you can pick where you want to go, what you want to eat, and there's probably going to be music. Even the coffee shop has music. Well, this community has always been transient. People came to work the coal mines. Many stayed. Some left, uh, in particular the men, left to go find jobs, and then wives would follow. They're starting to come back. It's hard to find a place to live here right now, which, you know, 
We used to say that the national uh, flower of this part of Appalachia was the for sale sign. Now, I could drive from here home, which is about four miles, and you'll see maybe one, maybe two. You used to see four or five in town before you even got out of town. So people are coming here. The economy, gas prices are lower in this region. Real estate costs are much lower than other parts of not just Virginia, but the entire country. There's an interesting migration that is a reverse migration from the West Coast East because it has gotten so expensive. I mean, it's more than a normal person can afford who's just a working individual. And that is making it very hard to live there. People are looking for options, just like they looked for options 200 years ago, only pointed west. Now, some are looking east. They get to these mountains and they look around. And like I said earlier, these mountains have haired over. We've had a little chance to, to rehabilitate a lot of, the coal, coal was strip mined and deep mined here. So that, most of that mining is, while they're still mining, it's much less now. It looks different, it looks better, it looks attractive. You walk into this country now and you see the red bud and you see the sequences of plants blooming. You, see, you have the trees and you have the sheltering aspect, which is really interesting because there were people who the mountains felt like they enclosed them and it scared them. That's why the Scottish Highlanders and the Irish felt so comfortable here, because their mountains were similar. Now, people look at the mountains, again, as a shelter. And they're starting to come for that shelter, because we all know it's a scary time all over the world. It's not the first, nor will it be the last. But right now, this is a very comfortable place to live. You can afford to buy a home possibly, compared, compared to what you would have paid if you can sell a home somewhere else. You can come here and buy substantially more than you had. One thing that's really true about what we've been through here in this region, because the divisions in this region were very real. Towns didn't like each other. First of all, because they played football against each other in high school. And there were six high schools in the area. And then the city of Norton, which it's own strange animal, because it's about the smallest city in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Well, there was this out migration that we've talked about, which didn't leave a lot of people here. One of the things, and because we knew we had to rebuild this economy, you have to have people feeling comfortable in what they're doing enough to basically invest. Well, we also had a heck of a lot of help because when I came here, these towns were very divided. Appalachia and Big Stone, two different high schools. Possibly the best high school football game I've ever seen was between Appalachia and Powell Valley, which is the valley that we sit in and it was, the interesting thing is, the quarterback of Appalachia now coaches Travis Turner, and his dad grew up in Appalachia and was the Hall of Fame coach from Appalachia. Travis now coaches Union High School because about 12 years ago, the high schools consolidated. People, enough people had left, we didn't have enough people to support these high schools. They were built when coal was king. They were old and they were kind of worn out. The state of Virginia really stepped up and the Appalachian Regional Commission really stepped up. Linowisco, which was Lee Wise, Norton, and Scott County, they had a, a it was basically a development organization that's based in Duffield. All of those things started pumping money. A tremendous amount of money went into remaking this economy. 
And for that, we thank not only Virginia, but the rest of the country because some of it was federal money. And it allowed, there were, there were loans made to this place when it first started, economic development loans, tourism marketing leverage grants that helped us start telling this story to a wider and wider audience. Well, what's also happened is like I said, Travis, who I watched play in that game, and some of the guys he played against are now coaches at Union High School. And I substitute teach there because I, I actually really enjoy the kids. They're crazy, but they're fun. Um, the culture is now melding. And the culture is starting to cross-pollinate where those kids all come to the same school. This is also true in Wise, where Central High School combines Pound and Wise. Norton still is independent, but then Eastside High School combines Coburn and St. Paul. We are starting to get what we hoped would happen, which is a regional identity instead of a one-town identity. And that is what efforts like Heart of Appalachia Tourism Authority, Big Stone Gap, which has a visitor. We never had a visitor center. Actually, that's not true. There was the interstate railroad car, which was a, a visitor center. But now Appalachia is building a visitor center. People have realized that while tourism will not ever be the driving part of the economy. I always called it the cake and the icing. And tourism, what we do as performers is the icing, but it makes people want to live here. They have some place to go to have fun. They have some place to go to get a good meal that's not in a chain restaurant. They have unique individuals and events. I mean, we have now a, fest, a bluegrass festival the Blue Highway Festival, and Blue Highway is an internationally known band that decided they were gonna have a festival. Well, where did they put it? Right here in Big Stone Gap. And if you look over on Myrtle, who's the pizza oven, there's Tommy Emanuel's signature. Tommy came down here and hung out. And people came here from all over the country. I've made friends now in California, in Ohio, who all came to that festival, and we all worked it and made it our own. And this next year, it's going to be even bigger. But the best music in that genre came from all over the country. And they all went home, the musicians, and this is another part of it. Musicians come to this area and they have fun. And the pressure's kind of off and they feel like they're in the birthplace of country music. They can feel Bristol. They can feel the heritage and they wanna be a part of it. And I worked the stage for that festival because that's what I used to do for a living. And the joy backstage and the cooperation and the smiles, that all went home to wherever they're from. They now know that this is good. And that's so much of what we wanted. Well, Ralph Stanley has his festival. You know, Ralph's passed on, but his son is carrying it on in Dickinson County. The Lyric Theater just was refurbished in St. Paul. We have places, we have venues. The Crooked Road still lives. I do a radio show called the Crooked Road Radio Hour, and I have the executive director of the Crooked Road and I sit together, I'm the first one, and she's about the fifth, fourth or fifth, and we talk about what's happened over the last 20 years with joy. And that is so much of what is going on right now. A place that had no joy, now has joy. Now is having fun. Now the jokes aren't cynical. The jokes look towards the future and what we may be able to still do in this place. Will there be, you know, bumps in the road? Of course. The economy is the economy. 
but we have a footing now that is somewhat different than depending on that rail car going out of town with coal of it and taking the money out of the region. The money that comes to this place stays right here. And that was the goal 20 years later. And I'm glad I'm still around to enjoy it because I'm having a really good time. <laughs>